The Elephant's Child, by Rudyard Kipling. Part One. The Elephant's Child wants some answers. In the beginning, elephants had noses. They had large noses, but they could not pick things up with them. One day, the elephant's child began to ask everybody questions. He always asked a lot of questions. He asked his aunt, the ostrich, "Why have you got long feathers?" The ostrich was angry with the elephant's child. She punished him and sent him away. "Don't ask questions, elephant's child," she told him. The elephant's child then went to his uncle, the giraffe. "Why have you got spots?" he asked the giraffe. His uncle, the giraffe, was angry with the elephant's child. He punished him and sent him away. "Don't ask questions, elephant's child," he told him. The elephant's child now went to his aunt, the hippopotamus. "Why have you got red eyes?" he asked his aunt. The hippopotamus was angry, and she too punished the elephant's child. "Don't ask questions," she told him. The elephant's child now went to his uncle, the baboon. Why do you like melons? He asked. Why are they good to eat? The baboon was angry, and he punished the elephant's child. Don't ask questions, elephant's child. He told him. One day, the elephant's child had a new question. What does the crocodile eat? He asked everybody. Be quiet, Be quiet, elephant's, elephant's child. child! Everybody shouted at him. His uncles and aunts were angry with the elephant's child. They all punished him for a long time. He was very unhappy. He went away for a walk in the forest. Part two, the great. Grey, green Limpopo River. The elephant's child met the cola cola bird in the forest. He told the cola cola bird everything. My father punished me, my uncles punished me, and my aunts punished me. He said. What does the crocodile eat? Do you know? The cola cola bird thought for a moment, then he said, "Do you know the great grey green Limpopo River?" "Yes," replied the elephant's child. "I know it." "Go there," the cola cola bird told the elephant's child. "You can ask there." I'll go there immediately," the elephant's child decided. The elephant's child walked through the forest until he came to the great, grey, green Limpopo River. Then he saw a python snake. "Excuse me," he said, "but is there a crocodile here?" "Yes." The python snake told him, "A crocodile lives here." Good," replied the elephant's child. "What does he eat?" The python was angry now, and he punished the elephant's child. "Don't ask questions, elephant's child," he told him. The elephant's child walked some more. He walked on something big. It was the crocodile. The elephant's child looked down. Where is the crocodile? 
he asked politely. The crocodile opened one eye very slowly. He looked at the elephant's child. Come here, elephant's child, he said quietly. I'm the crocodile. Good, cried the elephant's child. What do you eat? Come here. The crocodile told him again. The elephant's child came very close to the crocodile. The crocodile opened his mouth very wide. He held the elephant's child by the nose. Today, said the crocodile, I think I'll eat an elephant's child. Part three: The Elephant's Child and the Crocodile. The Python Snake arrived at that moment. He said to the Elephant's Child, "The Crocodile will eat you, my friend. You must pull as hard as you can. Pull, my young friend. Pull." The Elephant's Child pulled and he pulled. It was no good. His nose was still in the crocodile's mouth. The crocodile also pulled as hard as he could. He pulled and he pulled. The elephant's child's nose began to grow longer and longer. Suddenly, the elephant's child gave an extra hard pull, and he was free. He sat back on the ground. His nose was very long now, and very warm. He put it into the great, grey, green Lipopo River for a moment. Why are you doing that? Asked the python snake. My nose is too long. The elephant's child told him. Perhaps the river will make it small again. Your nose will always be like that now," the python told him. "But I don't like it," cried the elephant's child. "Perhaps you'll like it one day," the python said. "But it isn't a nose any more. It's too long for a nose. We'll call it a trunk." The elephant's child was not very happy at all. At that moment, a mosquito flew onto the elephant's child's head. The elephant's child lifted his trunk and hit the mosquito. The mosquito flew away. A trunk is a good thing, the python said. It's very useful. The elephant's child began to play with his new trunk. He picked up some grass. He ate the grass happily. Now tell me something," said the python. "Do people hit and punish you? Do you like that?" "Of course not," replied the elephant's child. "I don't like it at all." The python smiled at him. "Now you've got a trunk." He said, "Now you can hit and punish them." The elephant's child smiled too. "That's an idea," he said slowly. "A very good idea." He walked home. When he arrived, all his uncles and aunts were happy to see him. "Come, Come here, here, elephant's child!" child. They cried. The elephant's child moved towards them. He smiled happily. One by one, he punished his uncles and his aunts with his new trunk. Where, Where did, did you, you get, get the, the new nose? nose? They asked him. It's not a nose. The elephant's child told them. 
It's a trunk. I asked the crocodile what he eats. Then he gave me the trunk. We, We want, want trunks, trunks too! All the elephants cried. They ran off to the great grey green Limpopo River. When they found the crocodile, they asked him, "What, What do, do you, you eat? eat?" The crocodile pulled their noses. And now, all elephants have got trunks. Pigs is pigs by Ellis Parker Butler, Part One, The Correct Price for Pigs. Mr. Flannery worked for the Interurban Express Company. The company delivered parcels all over America. This morning, Mr. Flannery was very angry. His customer, Mr. Morehouse, was also very angry. You decide! Shouted Mr. Flannery. He indicated the box in front of him. The box contained two small guinea pigs. They were happy to eat their food. You can pay for them and take them away, or you can leave them here. But rules are rules, Mr. Morehouse. You're an idiot! Shouted Mr. Morehouse. The company rules are very clear. Look. Mr. Morehouse indicated a book on the counter. Then he read aloud: "Domestic pets in boxes, Franklin to Westcote, twenty-five cents each. These are domestic pets. They're in boxes, and they came from Franklin to Westcote. I'll pay twenty-five cents each. There are two of them. I'll pay you fifty cents." Mr. Flannery picked up the rule book. Now he began to read what it said. I know they're domestic pets, Mr. Flannery said angrily. And the price for domestic pets is twenty-five cents. But they're also pigs. I know that too. And the price for pigs is thirty cents each. You'll have to pay thirty cents each. That's sixty cents for two. That's ridiculous," replied Mr. Morehouse. "That rule means ordinary pigs, not guinea pigs. It's obvious. The correct rate is twenty-five cents each." Mr. Flannery was very stubborn. "Pigs are pigs," he said. "The company doesn't care. They are all pigs." Pigs are not domestic animals, and you must pay the rate for pigs. Mister Morehouse was silent for a moment. Very well, he said at last. I offered you fifty cents, and you refused. I'll write to the president of the company and tell him everything. Keep the pigs, but you must look after them very well. Nothing must happen to them. Mr. Morehouse left the office. Mr. Flannery opened the box with the guinea pigs inside. He looked at them. They were happy. Mr. Flannery was happy. He knew the rules about pigs. Part two. Letters about pigs. Mr. Morehouse was very angry when he arrived home. He wrote a long letter to the president of the company. He explained the problem about the rate for the guinea pigs. About a week later, Mr. Morehouse received a letter from the Interurban Express Company. Interurban Express Company, dear sir, please write to the claims department. Yours faithfully. Mr. Morehouse now wrote to the claims department of the company. A few weeks later, he received a reply from the claims department of the Interurban Express Company. Interurban Express Company, dear sir, the pigs are in Mr. Flannery's office. You did not pay anything to the company. 
you must write to the tariff department about the correct rate for the delivery of the pigs. Yours faithfully. Mr. Morehouse now wrote to the tariff department of the Interurban Express Company. The manager of the tariff department, Mr. Morgan, told his secretary to write to Mr. Flannery. He didn't pay the domestic rate. Ask him to explain, he ordered. And find out the present condition of the animals. Mr. Flannery received the letter from the tariff department. Present condition of the animals? He read. What does that mean? I'll look at them. He walked to the back of the office. There was a cage there. Mr. Flannery looked inside. He began to count carefully. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He counted. And all of them very well. Mr. Flannery went back into his office and wrote to the tariff department of the company. Dear Sir, Pigs are pigs. There are now eight pigs. They are all well. They eat a lot. I paid two dollars for their food. Will Mr. Morehouse pay for their food? Yours faithfully. Mr. Morgan, the head of the tariff department, read Mr. Flannery's letter. He was very serious. Flannery is right, he told his secretary. Pigs are pigs. Then he wrote another letter to Mr. Flannery. Interurban Express Company. Dear Mr. Flannery, the rules are clear. When the animals eat food, the customer must pay for it. Collect the two dollars from Mr. Morehouse. Yours sincerely, Morgan. Collect it, Mr. Flannery thought. I don't know how to do that. Suddenly, he had an idea. Part 3. Pigs Will Never Be Pigs Again Mr. Flannery drove to Mr. Morehouse's house. Mr. Morehouse smiled when he came out of the house. So you've brought the guinea pigs at last, he said. No, sir, replied Mr. Flannery. I've got a bill for two dollars for their food. Will you pay it? Two dollars, explained Mr. Morehouse. For food for two guinea pigs? That's ridiculous. I certainly won't pay it. There aren't two pigs, Mr. Flannery told him. There are eight of them now. Mr. Morehouse closed the door of the house loudly. Mr. Flannery drove back to his office. Mr. Flannery wrote again to Mr. Morgan, the head of the tariff department. This time, Mr. Morgan spoke to the president of the Interurban Express Company. Are they domestic pets, or are they pigs? Mr. Morgan wanted to know. The president thought for a moment. Then he said, I don't know. I'll write to Professor Gordon. He's an expert. He'll know. Unfortunately, Professor Gordon was in South America. The letter from the president of the Interurban Express Company arrived after many months. The president forgot about the problem. Mr. Morgan forgot about the problem. Even Mr. Morehouse forgot about the problem. Mr. Flannery, however, did not forget about the problem. He wrote again to Mr. Morgan. Dear Mr. Morgan, what about these pigs? There are now thirty-two of them. They still eat a lot. My office is now like 
a zoo. Shall I sell the pigs? Yours sincerely, Flannery. Mr. Morgan wrote back immediately. Dear Mr. Flannery, do not sell the pigs. They belong to Mr. Morehouse. The company must continue to look after them. Yours sincerely, Morgan. Mr. Flannery built a special place for the guinea pigs outside the office. A few months later, he wrote to Mr. Morgan again. His letter was very short. Dear Mr. Morgan, 160 pigs. Yours sincerely, Flannery. At last a letter came from Professor Gordon. He explained everything to the president of the company. Guinea pigs are not pigs. They belong to a completely different family and species. Then the 25 cent rate is the correct one, the president of the company decided. Mr. Morgan now wrote to Mr. Flannery. Dear Mr. Flannery, please deliver the 160 guinea pigs to Mr. Morehouse. He must pay 25 cents for each guinea pig. Yours sincerely, Morgan. Mr. Flannery wrote back immediately to Mr. Morgan. Dear Mr. Morgan, there are not 160 pigs. There are now 800. Do I have to charge Mr. Morehouse for 160 or for 800? Yours sincerely, Flannery. The Interurban Express Company considered the problem very carefully. This took time, and the number of guinea pigs increased every day. Now Mr. Flannery counted 4,064 of them. At last, Mr. Flannery received a letter from the company. Interurban Express Company, dear Mr. Flannery, collect for two guinea pigs 50 cents, deliver them all to Mr. Morehouse. Yours sincerely, Morgan. Once again, Mr. Flannery drove to Mr. Morehouse's home. Mr. Morehouse did not live there any more. Mr. Flannery asked the company for orders. The company told him to send the guinea pigs to the head office of the Interurban Express Company. Mr. Flannery began to send the cages of guinea pigs to the company. The company received cages of guinea pigs for days and days. Mr. Flannery sent 280 cages in one week. The company now sent him a telegram. Interurban Express Company, stop sending guinea pigs, warehouse full. And Mr. Flannery sent another telegram back. Can't stop, Flannery. The company sent an inspector to Mr. Flannery's office. The company's wagon was full of guinea pigs. That's the last of them, shouted Mr. Flannery angrily. I'll know what to do with animals next time, he said. Forget the rules. That's what I'll do. Pigs are pets. Cows are pets. Horses are pets. And lions and tigers are pets. Everything goes at 25 cents. The wagon drove away with the last guinea pigs. There's one good thing. Mr. Flannery said happily, At least those pigs weren't elephants. Listening Activity You will hear a dialogue between John and his mother. John, please bring me my glasses. Here you are, Mum. John, did you take the dog out this morning? Yes, I took it out before lunch. But the rubbish is still here, John. When are you going to take it away? OK, Mum. I'll bring you a nice cup of tea and then take it out. Oh, John, would you bring me some biscuits with my tea? All right, Mum. And when you go out with the rubbish, don't forget to take the clothes to the laundry. And while you're at it... 
Remember to take those films to be developed. John, are you listening? John? John, are you listening to me? Mrs. Packletide's Tiger by Saki Part 1 Mrs. Packletide Shoots a Tiger Mrs. Packletide was in India. She wanted to kill a tiger. She wanted to shoot a tiger for a special reason. Her friend, Luna Bimberton, flew in a plane. Luna talked about the plane all the time. Mrs. Packletide was jealous of her friend's adventure. She wanted an adventure as well. Mrs. Packletide had a plan. She wanted some journalists to take photographs of her with the dead tiger. Then she wanted to invite Luna Bimberton to lunch and to give her a tiger claw brooch. She wanted her friend to be jealous. Mrs. Packletide offered the Indians in the village one thousand rupees for a tiger. The Indians knew about a very old tiger in the area. It was not a dangerous animal. Mrs. Packletide was very happy. The Indians prepared a platform high up in a tree for Mrs. Packletide and her companion, Miss Mebbin. The two ladies climbed onto the platform one night. The Indians put a goat on the ground in front of the tree. Tigers like to eat goats. Mrs. Packletide and Miss Mebbin waited for the tiger to come. Is this really dangerous? Miss Mebbin asked. Not at all, Mrs. Packletide told her. The tiger is very old. He can't jump up into the tree. We're safe here. Why are you paying 1,000 rupees then? Miss Mebbin wanted to know. The tiger's old. It's not worth 1,000 rupees. Miss Mebbin was always interested in money. She liked to save money. It gave her pleasure to save money. Suddenly, the tiger moved out of the darkness. It saw the goat on the ground. It came very close, and then it lay down. It seemed tired. It looks ill, Miss Mebbin said very loudly. Be quiet, Mrs. Packletide commanded. The tiger now got up and began to walk towards the goat again. Shoot now, Miss Mebbin suggested. Don't let it go near the goat. Then we won't have to pay for the goat. We can save some money. Mrs. Packletide picked up her rifle. She fired quickly. The noise of the rifle was very loud. The tiger jumped into the air and then fell to the ground. It did not move. The Indians were very excited. They immediately ran forward. They looked at the dead tiger. They were very pleased. Mrs. Packletide was pleased too. She thought about her friend Luna Bimberton. Something is wrong, Louisa Mebbin said to Mrs. Packletide. You shot the goat, she told Mrs. Packletide. She indicated the goat. It was true. The goat had a bullet wound. There was no bullet wound on the tiger, but it, too, was dead. The old tiger was dead from a heart attack. At first, Mrs. Packletide was angry. Then she thought about it. She still had a dead tiger. The Indians had their thousand rupees.
Part Two: Triumph and Disaster. Soon the journalists came. They took photographs of Mrs. Packletide and the tiger. The pictures appeared in many newspapers, even the Texas Weekly Snapshot. Luna Bimberton saw them. She was very jealous. She received the tiger claw brooch. Then she was angry. She did not accept Mrs. Packletide's invitation to lunch. Mrs. Packletide and Miss Mebbin returned to London. They brought the tiger skin with them. Everyone admired it. Mrs. Packletide was very pleased and satisfied with her adventure. She went to a fancy dress party. She wore a Diana costume. No one knows the truth, Miss Mebbin said a few days later. What do you mean, Mrs. Packletide asked angrily. You didn't shoot the tiger at all, Miss Mebbin explained. You shot the goat. The tiger just died because it was afraid. Miss Mebbin laughed. <laughs> Mrs. Packletide's face went red. No one will believe that, she said quickly. Luna Bimberton will believe it, Miss Mebbin told her quietly. Mrs. Packletide went very white. Don't tell anyone, she said quietly. There's a little cottage near Dorking, Miss Mebbin replied slowly. I want to buy it. It costs six hundred and eighty pounds, but I haven't got the money. Louisa Mebbin has her little cottage in the country now. It is a very pretty place. All her friends like it very much. How does she pay to keep all this? They all ask. Mrs. Packletide. Does not hunt tigers any more. It's too expensive, she tells her friends. Listening activity. You will hear an interview with Mrs. Packletide about how she shot the tiger. Good evening. This is Leonard Burner reporting about an extraordinary trophy. The well-to-do Mrs. Packletide is very proud about her catch, a real Indian tiger. Today she met her friend Luna Bimberton, the well-known pilot, and gave her a tiger claw brooch. Mrs. Packletide, tell us about your adventure. Yes, well, good evening to all the lovely listeners out there. What can I say? I went to India, in the middle of the jungle. My goodness, with all those beastly animals! You understand, it's thick jungle, where you see nothing but wild animals. Yes, yes, very dangerous. Did you go alone? Well, not exactly. You see, Miss Louisa Mebbin, my dear companion, would not let me go alone. You must understand that I love Miss Mebbin, but she's not a courageous soul. I told Miss Mebbin that it was dangerous. You mean,、uh, Mrs. Packletide, that Miss Mebbin did not help you? Well, I don't want to be rude, but Miss Mebbin is not the ideal hunting companion. Well, Mrs. Packletide, please tell the listeners how you managed to kill the tiger. You see, I had this rifle, and well, I, we, were walking in the jungle unprotected. Yes, do go on. And yes, this big Indian tiger appeared suddenly. How frightening! Oh yes, it was awful. It came running out of the thick jungle. My. Goodness! It ran straight towards Miss Mebbin. Oh no! Exactly. 
I had to save her life. So you shot and saved Miss Mebbin's life. Well, you know, she is my companion. Yes, I understand. A very brave act, Mrs. Packletide. A very brave act. Thank goodness you saved her life. Yes, thank goodness she's alive. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. No, thank you, Mrs. Packletide. And this is the end of today's broadcast.、Uh... The Stolen White Elephant, by Mark Twain, Part One, A Royal Present. Once I met a man on a train who told me a story. This is his story. The white elephant is a very important animal in Siam. Only the king can possess one. Many years ago, Britain and Siam argued about the frontier line of Siam. Siam was wrong, and the two countries soon became friends again. The king of Siam. Decided to send the British Queen a magnificent present, a white elephant. It was my job to transport the white elephant from Siam to England. We left Siam in a ship with the elephant, and at last we arrived in New York. We decided to send the elephant to New Jersey for a while. He needed rest after the first part of the long voyage. Then a terrible thing suddenly happened. Someone stole the white elephant. I went to the New York police. The chief detective was called Inspector Blunt. He listened to my story in silence. This is not an ordinary case, he said. Do not talk to the reporters. I will manage them. Now. He said, "What's the elephant's name?" Hassan Ben Ali Ben Selim Abdallah Mohammed Moise Al Hamal Jamstajie Bohoy Dulip Sultan Abu Budpur. I told him. Good. First name, Jumbo. Are his parents living? No, they're dead. Was he the only child? Yes, he was. Now describe it. Inspector Blunt commanded me. I began describing the white elephant. Height nineteen feet. Length of trunk sixteen feet. Length of tail six feet. Total length, including trunk and tail, forty-eight feet. Color of the elephant. A dull white. He has the habit of spraying people with water. He has a small scar under his arm. The detective wrote everything down. Now I want a photograph. Inspector Blunt told me. I gave him a photograph of the white elephant. Then he rang a bell and a boy came in. Make fifty thousand copies of this description and photograph, Alaric. He ordered the boy. Give them to all the detective officers. Alaric left the room. We will have to offer a reward. Inspector Blunt told me. How much? I asked. To begin with, twenty-five thousand dollars. The inspector told me these thieves are very clever, and they have friends everywhere. Do you know who they are? I asked in great surprise and astonishment. We usually have an idea who the criminal is. He told me. Inspector Blunt then asked me about the food that the elephant ate. Men. Does he eat men? The inspector asked. "Oh yes," I replied. "But he will eat anything. He will eat books, bottles, clothes, cats, potatoes, rice, anything at all." Good, but we need details. Details are 
necessary. During one day, how many men will he eat if they are fresh? He does not care if they are fresh or not. At a single meal, he can eat five men. What nationalities does he prefer? He doesn't care about nationalities, but he prefers people he knows. What does he drink? The inspector wanted to know. He drinks anything as well. I told him, "These are unusual facts." The inspector commented, "They will help us to find the elephant." Listening activity. You will hear a police inspector interviewing someone about a missing person. This is a strange case. What is your husband's name? His name is Arnold Landlow. Do spell that for me, ma'am. Yes, of course. L, A, N, D, L, O, W. Very good. And where does he live? Well, he lives with me, of course. The address.、Uh, the address. I need to know his address, please, ma'am. Yes. We live at one hundred and five Third Avenue, New York. Very good. Very good. And what does he look like? Oh, Inspector. Dreadful. He looks just. Dreadful. Come on, ma'am. I mean, can you describe him, please? Well, he's short. Very short. He's thin. Very thin. And well, he doesn't have any hair on his head. He's completely bald. Oh. But he has hair on the palms of his hands. Hair on the palms of his hands? You mean he's a beast? No, sir. Well, sort of. No, no, he is a man, you know. He's very clever. Hmm. You say you lost him after you went shopping with him. Well, Inspector, he lost the keys to the house. We went to the department store and made a new set of keys. Then what happened? Well, he had to go to the barber's for a shave. Yes, I see. And well, I went home. Did you go back to the barber's when he did not come home? Well, I left the house almost immediately because I had to visit my sick aunt. Did you return home after that? Yes, I did. I went home and he wasn't there. So what did you do then? I went to the barber's, but he wasn't there. Can I see the keys to your house? Of course. Here they are. Two sets of keys. Listen here, ma'am. An officer will go to your house with you immediately. But first, I must examine these sets of keys. In your statement, you said you only had one set, and well, here we are with two sets. That's my... Part two. Inspector Blunt gives his orders. Inspector Blunt now called Captain Burns. The inspector described the case to him, and then he gave his instructions. Tell Detectives Jones, Davis, Bates, and Hackett to follow the elephant, and tell Detectives Moses, Dakin, Murphy, Rogers, and Bartholomew to follow the thieves. Yes, sir," the captain said. "We'll find your elephant," the inspector told me. I thanked him. I liked that man. And I liked the way he approached the case. The next morning, the newspapers were full of the story of the stolen elephant. Some of the newspapers 
gave the opinions of different detectives about the case. Each detective had a different opinion. All the detectives named the criminals, but they all gave different names. The newspaper articles finished with a mention of Inspector Blunt. He knows that the criminals are Brick, Duffy, and Red McFadden. He knew that they had plans for the crime. I was pleased when I read the newspaper article. It was clear that Inspector Blunt was a very clever detective. I hurried to his office to talk to him again. You know who the thieves are, I said. Why didn't you arrest them before the crime? We do not prevent crime, he told me. We punish crime. We cannot punish it until it is committed. Then I noticed something strange about the reward for $25,000. The reward was only for detectives. What about the public? I asked. The detectives will find the elephant, he explained to me. That is why the reward is for them. Now the telegraph in the office began to bring in the first messages from the inspector's men. Flower Station, New York, 7.30 a.m. Found a clue. Think the elephant is going west. I am following. Darley, detective. Darley's a good man, the inspector said. Another telegram arrived. Flower Station, New York, 9 a.m. Followed the tracks for three miles. A farmer told me they are not elephant tracks. They are holes he made for planting trees. Tell me what to do. Darley, detective. The inspector sent Darley a telegram. Arrest the man. He is one of the thieves. Follow the tracks. Inspector Blunt. Next, a telegram arrived from Hawes. Ironville, New York, 9.30 a.m. The elephant was here this morning... No one knows where he went. He killed a horse. Hawes, detective. Inspector Blunt called Captain Burns. Send a lot of men to Ironville, he ordered. More messages arrived from all over New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Then a very strange one arrived. It was from the famous circus Barnum's. It offered $4,000 a year to use the elephant for advertising the circus. The idea was to attach advertisements to the elephant's body. Ridiculous, I cried. Of course it is, Inspector Blunt agreed. Mr. Barnum does not know me, but I know him. The inspector sent a message to Mr. Barnum. Seven thousand dollars or nothing. Inspector Blunt. Back came an immediate reply. Agreed. P.T. Barnum. A little while later, other telegrams arrived. Glovers, 11.15 a.m. Just arrived. The village is deserted except for the sick and the old. During a village meeting, the elephant put his trunk in a window and washed the meeting room with water. Some people drank the water and died. Others drowned. The whole region lives in terror. Brandt, detective. Bolivia, New York, 12.50 p.m. The elephant arrived here and disturbed a funeral procession. It killed two people. Several citizens tried to shoot it. Some of the bullets hit it. Detective Burke and I followed the animal into the woods. The elephant stopped to rest, and Burke came very close to it. He shouted out, The reward is mine. The elephant turned round and killed him with its trunk. I ran away. The elephant chased me back to the funeral procession. The elephant killed more people. I do not know where it is now. Mulroney, detective.
That was the final telegram that we received. Part 3. The End of the Case I was very unhappy. The elephant was responsible for many deaths, and I was responsible for the elephant. There were more telegrams that day from all over America about the elephant, but it was clear that no one knew where it was. It was the same thing the next day. The newspapers were tired with the story now. There was nothing exciting to report. The inspector suggested increasing the reward from $25,000 to $50,000. Four days passed. There was still no news of the elephant. I followed the inspector's advice again and increased the reward from $50,000 to $75,000. The newspapers now began to attack the detectives. They made rude comments about them. Only one man remained calm, and that was Inspector Blunt. I admired him very much. About three weeks after the elephant disappeared, Inspector Blunt had a brilliant idea. He decided to contact the thieves and make an agreement with them. One hundred thousand dollars will be enough, he said. We can't give the thieves a hundred thousand dollars, I said. The detectives won't get anything. Yes, they will, Inspector Blunt told me. When there is an agreement, the detectives get half of the money. Inspector Blunt wrote two letters, one to the wife of Brick Duffy and the other to the wife of Red McFadden. Dear Madam, your husband can make a lot of money if he comes to see me. Inspector Blunt. He soon received these replies to the letters. You old fool! Rick McDuffie died two years ago. Chief, they hanged Red McFadden eighteen months ago. Inspector Blunt then had another idea. He wrote a mysterious advertisement in the morning papers. He told me this advertisement invited the thief to meet him at midnight the following night. I arrived at the inspector's office at 11 p.m. the following night with the $100,000. He took the money and he left the office. I waited there. At last he came back. He looked very happy. We've made a deal. Follow me. I followed the detective down into the basement where the detectives worked. It was dark there. The inspector fell over a large object. Then he cried out excitedly. The elephant! I found it! All the detectives were very happy now. Everybody congratulated the inspector on his discovery. Give that man a clue and he'll find anything, they said happily. Then they divided the $100,000 and that was a happy occasion too. The next day, the newspapers were full of praise, except for one. It said, What a great detective! He may be a little slow to find a little thing like a lost elephant. He hunted him all day and slept with his dead body all night for three weeks. However, he found him at last, because the man who lost him showed him the place. Poor Hassan was dead. The bullets wounded him fatally. He reached the detective's building, and there, surrounded by his enemies, he suffered and died of hunger. This adventure cost me $100,000, plus my detective expenses of $42,000. I never worked for the government again. I do not have any money, and I am a ruined man. But I admire Inspector Blunt as the greatest detective in the world. Listening Activity Listen to the conversation between a man and a police officer. Hello, is that 9, 8, 
seven three six five. Yes, it is. How can I help you, sir? I'm calling to claim the forty-five thousand dollar reward. The thirty-five thousand dollar reward is for the missing guinea pig. Where did you find it? No, I'm claiming the forty-five thousand dollar reward for the missing needle in the haystack. Sir, I have good news. The missing needle in the haystack reward is now worth one hundred thousand dollars. What do you mean, good news? Do you mean to say it has gone down? To ten thousand dollars? No, no, sir. It has gone up to one hundred thousand, one zero 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 dollars. Really? Tell me, what do I have to do? Well, all you have to do is tell me where you found the needle, sir, and the money is yours. Why, that's easy. I found it in a haystack, of course. How about that? The shameful behaviour of a fox terrier, from Three Men and a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Part One: The Haymarket Stores. Fox terriers are about four times more mischievous than other dogs. Their behaviour is shameful. It takes years and years of patience to train them. I remember what happened in the lobby of the Haymarket stores. I was in the lobby, and there were many dogs all around me. Their owners were inside the shop, doing their shopping. There was a bulldog, two collies, a Saint Bernard, some Yorkshire terriers, a hound, and a French poodle. There were also a few other smaller dogs. They were about as big as rats. They all sat in the lobby patiently and silently. Then, a lovely young lady entered the lobby. She had a sweet little fox terrier. She left him there between the bulldog and the poodle. At first, he sat and looked around. Then he looked up, and started looking at the other dogs, who were silent and dignified. First, he looked at the bulldog, who was asleep on his right. After, he looked at the poodle, who was on his left. Then suddenly, the little fox terrier bit the poodle's front leg. There was a cry of agony in the lobby. The fox terrier was evidently satisfied with the result of his experiment, so he decided to continue and create some excitement. He jumped over the poodle and attacked the collie. The collie woke up and immediately started fighting with the poodle. Then the fox terrier returned to his place. He bit the ear of the bulldog and tried to throw him across the lobby. The bulldog attacked everything he could find, including the porter. This gave the dear little fox terrier the opportunity to fight with a brave little Yorkshire terrier. Anyone who understands dogs will know that by this time there was a great big fight in the lobby with all the dogs. Big dogs fought the big dogs, and the little dogs fought the little dogs. At times, the little dogs bit the legs of the big dogs. The lobby was in chaos, and the noise was terrible. Soon, there was a crowd of people outside the Haymarket stores. They asked, "Is, is there, there a, a religious, religious meeting inside?" inside? And is, is someone, someone killing, killing someone, someone else? else? Why? Why? Some men came with poles and tried to separate the fighting dogs. Then someone called the police. During the fighting, the lovely young lady returned. She picked up her sweet little dog, who looked at her innocently, and she kissed him. My poor little dear, 
What did those big, bad dogs do to you? The little fox terrier looked at her and seemed to say, Oh, thank you for saving me from this horrible fight. <laughs> the young lady said, The haymarket stores must not permit big, savage dogs to stay with gentle little dogs. This is terrible. I must talk to someone about this. And this is the nature of fox terriers. Part 2 Montmorency Now, the only thing my fox terrier Montmorency and I don't agree on is cats. I like cats, and Montmorency doesn't. When I meet a cat, I stop and say hello. I touch it gently. The cat is happy, and I am too. When Montmorency meets a cat, the whole street knows about it. A lot of bad words fly through the air. Now, I know that my fox terrier is not really bad. It is only his nature. But something really unforgettable happened when we were in Marlow. We went swimming before breakfast, and on the way back, Montmorency met a cat. As soon as he saw the cat, he barked with happiness. The cat walked slowly across the street. Montmorency ran after the cat, but the cat didn't run. He didn't understand that his life was in danger. This cat was big and black. It had half a tail, half a nose, and only one ear. It was a clever street cat. Montmorency is a courageous dog, but the cold eyes of that cat terrified him. The cat stopped in the middle of the road and looked at Montmorency with his cold eyes. The cat and dog did not speak, but their conversation was probably like this. Yes? You want me? Can I do anything for you? No, no thanks. If you really want something, please tell me. No, thanks. Nothing at all. Very kind of you. I, I am afraid I made a mistake. I thought I knew you. Sorry I disturbed you. Not at all. Quite a pleasure. Sure you don't want anything now? No, no nothing at all. Very kind of you. Good morning. Good morning. The cat got up and walked away. Montmorency came back and followed us very quietly. He was silent all day long. To this day, if you say the word cats to Montmorency, he'll stop walking. Then he'll look up at you as if to say, Oh, please don't. Listening activity. You will hear only the cat's part of the conversation. You must pretend to be Montmorency and act out his part. Yes. You want me? Can I do anything for you? If you really want something, please tell me. Not at all. Quite a pleasure. Sure you don't want anything now? Good morning. 
You will hear a recording of parts of the original stories in this book. Listen and say which extract is from which story. 1. He took a pen and some paper. Now, name of the elephant? Hassan ben Ali ben Selim Abdallah Mohammed Moist Al Hamal Jamset Jiji Boy Dulip Sultan Ebu Budpur. Very well. Given name? Jumbo. Very well. Place of birth? The capital city of Siam. Parents living? No, dead. Had they any other issue besides this one? None. He was an only child. 2. Do as you like, then, shouted Flannery. Pay for him and take him, or don't pay for him and leave him be. Rules is rules, Mr. Morehouse, and Mike Flannery's not going to be called down for breaking of them. But you everlastingly stupid idiot, shouted Mr. Morehouse, madly shaking a flimsy printed book beneath the agent's nose. Can't you read it here in your own plain printed rates? Pets domestic, Franklin to West Coast, if properly boxed, 25 cents each. He threw the book on the counter in disgust. What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they properly boxed? What? In the high and far-off times, the elephant, O oh best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose, as big as a boot, that he could wriggle about from side to side. But he couldn't pick up things with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, who was full of insatiable curiosity, and that means he asked ever so many questions. I remember being in the lobby of the haymarket stores one day, and all round about me were dogs, waiting for the return of their owners, who were shopping inside. There were a mastiff, and one or two collies, and a St. Bernard, a few retrievers and Newfoundlands, a boar hound, a French poodle, with plenty of hair round its head, but mangy about the middle, a bulldog, a few Lowther Arcade sort of animals, about the size of rats, and a couple of Yorkshire tykes. There they sat, patient, good, and thoughtful. A solemn peacefulness. It was Mrs. Packletide's pleasure and intention that she should shoot a tiger. Not that the lust to kill had suddenly descended on her or that she felt that she would leave India safer and more wholesome than she had found it, with one fraction less of wild beast per million of inhabitants. Mm -hmm.